our previous discussion of receptors and signal transduction, we reminded you of the basic types of receptors. Now we're going to look at how receptors and signal transduction can respond to our therapy. We'll discover the phenomenon of tachyphylaxis and tolerance to drugs and how receptors can adjust their sensitivity in numbers in response to the presence or absence of stimulating transmitters and hormones. Finally, we'll discuss the special intrinsic feature of some systems called spare receptors that facilitate a rapid activation and deactivation of a signal in some systems. All the while, we'll note how important these concepts are to the clinician. Now, it's important at this time to note that certainly variability in response to a given drug can vary between patients. That is, in some patients consistently responding more to a drug and some responding less. As we're reminded by this Gaussian or bell-shaped distribution curve of patient responses to a drug. However, what we'd like to discuss now is the response to a drug can change with time within a specific patient following initial administration. With that background, what receptor phenomena can occur after initiation of a drug administration? In general, the clinician can observe the relatively rapid loss of effect over a short time frame, that is, from minutes to days, for which the term tachyphylaxis is used. As an example of this phenomenon, decongestant nasal sprays and eye drops often include alpha receptor adrenergic agonists for topical decongestion by nasal mucosal blood vessel constriction. Phenylephrine is an example. So what happens as you use a nasal decongestant on yourself or your animal patient longer than several days? Much of the effect is lost after this period. The mechanism of this tachyphylaxis is caused by alpha adrenergic mediated receptor downregulation and drug-induced desensitization of response. So now we know that the body has mechanisms by which it can adapt to the administration of multiple doses of a drug or toxin. And both receptor and signal transduction mechanisms can be involved with this adaptation. This general term for developed hyporeactivity is called tolerance. However, the mechanisms leading to tolerance after chronic dosing may be difficult to distinguish in the individual patient unless a complete dose response study is performed. And this isn't very practical. The graphic we showed, just showed you was an in vitro study of vascular smooth muscle. However, the cellular tissue studies have uncovered the following mechanisms. The response of a drug stimulating G-protein coupled receptors may fall rapidly or more slowly. Exemplified by the beta adrenergic receptor rapid desensitization, it's usually associated with the receptor phosphorylated by a G-protein receptor kinase, GRK, followed by binding to the protein called arrestin. When the agonist is removed, cellular phosphatases reverse the effect. So returning to our sigmoidal log dose response curve, in a desensitized state, the dose effect curve would be shifted in parallel to the higher concentrations, that is, to the right, from curve 1 to 2, as shown in this figure. And apparently, the EC50 would be higher, meaning that the same drug dosage or concentration would lead to a lower effect than initially. The second mechanism by which a cell or tissue can modulate a drug's action is called downregulation. With some, including beta adrenergic receptors and epidermal growth factor receptors, chronic stimulation leads to increasing modification of the receptor by the addition of the protein ubiquitin, which then can tra traffic it to lysosomes, which then destroy the receptor, effectively reducing the number of receptors available on the plasma membrane. The rate of ubiquitination and deubiquitination serve to control the number of receptors available to ligands on the cell surface. We'll talk about the clinical relevance of supersensitivity shortly. Again, returning to our log dose effect curve, this downregulation is shown in curve 3, where you can see that the Emax is reduced as a secondary effect of reduced receptor number, that is, Bmax. A third mechanism for reduction of a drug's effect is a reduction of signal transduction mediators or the amounts of the signal that is like a neurotransmitter itself. For example, the adrenergic agent amphetamine leads to the release of synaptic catecholamines. 
Chronic administration may lead to the eventual depletion of catecholamine stores and a reduction of the potential signal that they can bring. As implied a little while ago, the clinician needs to realize that physiological and pharmacological factors can also lead to supersensitivity as well. This can lead to a cellular state of hyperreactivity to a drug. For example, when there is a reduction of endogenous physiological neurotransmitter or hormone, supersensitization that's associated with a reduced EC50 and an increased or an increased Emax can occur. Pharmacological causes such as the prior administration of receptor antagonists can set up the same scenario. For example, beta-adrenergic blockers such as propranolol or atenolol used to manage heart rate and blood pressure reduce signaling through the linked adenylate cyclase. The reduction in cyclic ANP and also the receptor degradation rate eventually result in upregulation of beta receptors on the cell membrane. Withdrawal of these drugs would initially be associated with hyperactivity to endogenous mediators such as epinephrine, leading potentially to rebound hypertension. The clinical effect is known as overshoot and is the reason that gradual withdrawal of autonomic drugs is recommended whenever possible to allow cell and tissue responsiveness to return to normal. Another reason to understand the signaling mechanisms comes in when you use two drugs that alter signal transduction in complementary ways. For example, you might use beta-2 agonists alone to achieve respiratory smooth muscle relaxation and therefore bronchodilation. Likewise, the drug class called the phosphodiesterase inhibitors, like theophylline, block degradation of cyclic AMP. Using these two drug classes together leads to a magnified complementary effect leading to a higher intracellular cyclic AMP concentration that is mediating the final end clinical result. Another example of tolerance is associated with the administration of opioid agonist drugs like morphine. In fact, the cellular changes that occur correlate and explain the existence of withdrawal signs when the opioid agonist is withdrawn. How does this all occur? Well, mu opioid receptor stimulation is linked to a G inhibitory regulatory protein that through mechanisms shown here results in the inhibition of adenylate cyclase and reduction in cyclic AMP. However, the cell adapts by also signaling through nuclear receptor mechanisms to make more adenylate cyclase enzyme protein and this Increased adenylate cyclase moves the cellular cyclic AMP concentration back to normal. The problem occurs when the opioid agonist is withdrawn and the increased number of adenylate cyclase enzyme units are no longer inhibited and make excessive cyclic AMP, leading to signs associated with withdrawal. Only more gradual reduction of the opioid drug is capable of preventing the drastic swing of intracellular cyclic AMP. Let's now move to our final receptor phenomenon of relevance to clinician. That would be spare receptors. Not occurring as an adjustment to prior drug administration, this phenomenon is a built-in feature of the receptor system itself, and it can vary considerably between species. As shown in the log dose effect curve, with some drugs, the maximum biological effect is achievable at much lower doses or concentration than what would be expected based upon the receptor's binding affinity. Another way of saying this is that this concentration associated with the KD is much greater than that of the EC50. A classical example of spare receptors is found in the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor system. These low affinity receptors are linked to sodium channels. The low affinity of these receptors allows synaptic acetylcholine, normally at a high concentration of 1 millimolar, to rapidly dissociate from its receptor to end the initiating neurotransmitter stimulus. The acetylcholine is then destroyed by synaptic acetylcholinesterase. Also, once depolarized, these receptors undergo temporary desensitization. As a result, to maintain the potential for repetitive stimulation at normal physiological rates, additional receptors must be recruited to maintain contraction. So spare receptor capacity provides a mechanism for obtaining maximal response despite a relatively low affinity of the receptor.
Now let's turn to a drug administration scenario impacting this spare receptor system we just described. First, let's compare an, a theoretical animal species A that has no spare receptors to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Now let's look at the rat, which has 50% spare receptors, shown as R, and the cat, which has 80% spare receptors, shown as C. As you can see on the log concentration effect plot, although each may have different receptor affinities, they all can lead to the same maximal effect at some concentration. The real clinical relevance can be revealed by trying to block these receptors with a competitive antagonist like the neuromuscular relaxant d tubocurarine or one of its analogs, which compete with acetylcholine to block the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in a competitive manner. These receptors exist in the postsynaptic membrane of skeletal muscle and are used during anesthetic protocols to optimize muscle relaxation. So, for the skeletal muscle relaxation effect, competitive antagonist d 2 curarine must not only block the active receptors, but also the spare receptors. As shown in this graphic, assuming that 10 receptors represent all of them, in A we show a normal receptor system requiring full receptor occupancy for full effect. In R and C, we're representing the rat and the cat, in which 50 and 20% occupancy can achieve the maximal effect, we show that there are spare receptors. So conversely, in the presence of a competitive antagonist like d 2 you can see that the similar receptor occupancy can lead to reduction of the effect in A, but not in the rat or the cat. So now if we realize that most neuromuscular blocking drug protocols achieve 90% receptor blockade, Hopefully you can see that the margin of safety for use of a competitive neuromuscular blocker to achieve and maintain muscular relaxation during anesthetic procedures is much less in the cat than in the rat. In reality, 65 micrograms per kilogram of d 2 leads to 50% neuromuscular blockade in a rat, but it takes 158 micrograms per kilogram to achieve the same thing in a cat. And here we show that the same 90% of receptor blockade leads to actually blockade of 80% of the rat's active receptor pool, but only 50% of that of the cat. As animals are normally intubated during their muscular blockade, a predictable and reasonable duration of action is important. The duration of action is around 16 minutes in the rat and 6 in the cat. The short duration of action indicates that greater attention must be paid to a cat's muscle relaxation status as it impacts when the cat needs to be intubated or extubated upon recovery. So in summary, the clinician should realize that receptors in tissues in living patients are not static targets, but can adapt to drug administration by adapting the sensitivity of their receptors and signaling transduction pathways. Receptors may be classified as either inotropic, that is linked to ion channels, metabotropic, that is linked to intracellular mediators, or nuclear, linked to the production of specific messenger RNA and proteins. Tolerance, the reduction of an effect to a specific drug dosage in a specific patient, can be rapid, that is tachyphylaxis, or slow, and has been associated with receptor desensitization or downregulation. Conversely, autonomic receptor antagonist administration can be associated with receptor upregulation and increased production of an endogenous neurotransmitters. As a result, too rapid a withdrawal of the antagonist can result in an overshoot phenomenon. And the presence of spare receptors needs to be considered when using competitive nicotinic acetylcholine receptor antagonists such as muscle relaxants.